What a joy it is to be here today. What a blessing it is that our God has blessed us with such a beautiful day to be together, to worship, to sing, to pray, to remember His Son, as we have done, and now to take a portion of our morning together, to study, to think together, and to ask ourselves this morning that question. Now, on the handout, on the screen, it's going to be worded slightly different, but we're going to make it this morning, am I a hypocrite? What a question, right? But before we ask that question and hopefully answer that question, let's pray together one more time. Let's pray. Almighty Father, our God, the one before whom we bow with our thoughts toward you and your glory, your love, your graciousness toward us. We come giving thanks and praise to you. We come with our hearts ready to receive your word, with our hands ready to open it up, our eyes to look and to read, our minds to think. We come this morning and we pray that you would help us as we do all of this. We pray that you would help us as we not only look at your word, but as we look at ourselves. We pray that we might be able today, but not just this morning, but more so beyond, to be people who self-examine. We pray that you would help us to be people who look in the mirror, and look into our own hearts, and look at our own lives. As we strive to be authentic, pure and sincere disciples of your Son, we pray through his holy name. Amen. As we said, the question this morning is, are you, that just, that feels funny to even say it that way, so am I, are you a hypocrite? When you start reading through the gospel accounts, we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four, we call them gospels for short. They're these recordings, inspired records of Jesus' life, from his birth to his ascension to heaven. And his ministry is, of course, a focal part of that, those three, roughly three years. And then his death and resurrection becomes even more of a focus and takes up a good percentage of of those books. But as you read through them, there are there is at least eight different occasions recorded. And we're not going to look at all eight even this morning. People, sinners, the most repulsive people to Jesus, the, the people that Jesus would not even want to be in the same room with. And, and Jesus sits around a table and has compassion on them. But it's the people, often leaders, but not just leaders, the people that were caught up in, the, in following this type of leader that Jesus, I'm not saying he doesn't have any compassion for, but he is very, very strong in his words to them. As you look at the book of Matthew, and we're going to spend most of our time in Matthew this morning, and so if you want to make your way to Matthew, although actually I just steered you the wrong way. Actually, go to Luke chapter 12. My apologies there. Look at Luke chapter 12. Go ahead and open up there. We're going to look at one verse in Luke as kind of a launch pad to send us into Matthew. And if that doesn't make sense, maybe it will in a minute. And if it doesn't, you can write me a note afterwards telling me why it didn't make sense. But in Matthew, just stay with me in thought in Matthew. So open up to Luke, but think about Matthew for a moment. In Matthew, you have five big lengthy teaching sections from Jesus. They're, they're sometimes referred to as the books within the book of Matthew. They're parallel to the five books of Moses. And so you have these five different times in Matthew's book where Jesus, Matthew records these long, we, we call them sometimes sermons. The first one, you probably know. It's the Sermon on the, the Mount. That's the first one. It's three chapters long in Matthew. But there's four more that follow. The fifth and final one, therefore, is Matthew 23. And it is all about the question, am I a hypocrite? Luke chapter 12 is our launchpad verse 
we're going to use to take us to Matthew. Luke chapter 12, let's just read the first verse together of this chapter. This is a summary warning from our Savior to His disciples and as disciples of Jesus this morning to us, His disciples in the 21st century. Here it is. The baseline from Jesus about this idea. He says, Luke records, In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together, they were trampling one another, he began to say his, to his disciples first. So there, there, there's all these people, but here's, here's what he really wants the disciples to get as a priority message. Beware. Beware. We don't usually use that word too much today. On the back of a cup of coffee, it might say warning, and then have a colon. The contents may be hot. That's this word. Beware. Watch out. Be careful. Warning. Beware, he says, of the leaven of the Pharisees. This religious, zealous group. The separate ones who would isolate themselves and draw lines in the sand. Beware of their leaven or of their corrupting and spreading power, their influence. Beware. And then just so they and we this morning don't miss the point, he then clarifies and says what? Which is hypocrisy. The danger, Jesus says to us this morning, of this group he calls the Pharisees that are the primary identified recipients of his rebukes that we're about to read in Matthew 23. He says, beware of their influence. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Putting on a mask. Wearing a face that might not reflect the reality behind it. Let's turn now together to Matthew 23. Here's the first description Jesus gives us. Am I a hypocrite? The first one is that hypocrites in Matthew 23 and in other places preach instead of practice. We have a saying that's been around for a long time. We've developed from the words of Jesus about this. What do we say? You better practice what you preach. And that's not just about preachers. I mean, preachers and teachers, elders, ministers, deacons, those that have roles like that, this applies in a big way for us. But not to leave the rest of us alone, I'm not trying to, to protect myself this morning, I hope, but this applies to any disciple of Jesus, to some, in some way or another. Because all of us, we make claims. All of us, in a way, preach but a hypocrite, they only do that. They talk, the talk as we say, we have another phrase for that, right? But they don't, they don't walk the walk. Look at Matthew 23, the first four verses this morning of this chapter, this whole chapter about hypocrisy. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4, they preach instead of practice. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, there they are again, the Pharisees, the scribes were a subset usually of the Pharisees, and so they're grouped together here throughout Jesus' ministry. He says they sit on Moses' seat. This is the teacher's seat in the synagogues. You could say this morning it's, it's like the, the stage or the platform that someone preaches or teaches from, or it's where the lectern is, where someone teaches a class, and so on. So they, they sit there, they have these positions where they teach, they preach. And so he says in verse 3, so do and observe whatever they tell you. Now, now this is not without qualifiers, certainly. There are some things that Jesus elsewhere will say they teach that is wrong, but he's addressing the basic problem here. The basic problem is not so much what they say. Often they're reading directly from the Old Testament Scripture. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. They're teaching the law of Moses. So listen to them, but don't follow what they do. What does he say in the rest of it? 
says, observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. And then watch it. Here it is. For they preach, but do not practice. And yes, I cheated in my outline this morning. I stole it from Jesus. Verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. Here's this word picture. See it? It's like a, a camel being loaded down. Or someone, as he says, on their shoulders, you give me a picture of someone carrying something. And it's like when you're about to carry something and you say, okay, load me up. And they say, they'll, they'll load you up. Sure. They'll give you this big load and they tie it down on your shoulders. But then the rest of verse 4, he says, they themselves. And there's lots of these contrasts here, right? He says, they do this, but, this, but, but. They themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. What a picture is that? So they're going to load you down, but then they're not even willing to lift at all, even a little burden with their, their just a finger. And you've got a whole load they've had to tie down just so it stays on, on your shoulders. But it is easy this morning, and it's always easy to read passages like Matthew 23 and think, those people to shake our heads and disgust. And we feel like Jesus, don't we? What? How could you do that? But it's something different. Read Matthew 23 and say, do I ever do that? Do I ever have the, the, not, the reputation people that I work with, they know I'm a Christian, I go to church, on Sunday mornings like today. But when Monday comes around and I'm at work, you wouldn't know it. Not by the way I talk or by my work ethic. And then when it comes to somebody else, though, oh, I'll, I'll tear into them. Whether it's behind their back in gossip or it's in their face in bitter, mean-spirited attitude. And if it's somebody else... Well, they better do this and that. They better toe the line. And I start drawing my circles of, well, this is what it looks like to be a Christian. You better do this. And I'm not even in my own circle. It reminds me of the man that he decided for his vacation, he'd go hiking in the mountains and camping at the same time. He's going to get back to the old ways. And so he goes to the camping store, big camping retail store. And he approaches the owner of the store and he, he, he explains his plan. But he doesn't know anything about camping or any of this or hiking. And so the guy says, sure, I'll help you out. So he takes him around the whole store and he says, well, you need this. Here's these camping pots and pans. And then you need this. Here's some fire starting equipment. And you need this. Here's, here's you a small tent. And just on and on it went. You get the drill. And, and the man begins to look at his pile of stuff. And he says, how am I going to carry all this? into the mountains. And the owner says, oh, let me show you. And so he takes him over here to the side of the store and he says, look at this, this backpack, this, this one, this one will hold everything. It's, it's big enough. It's the biggest one, the best one I've got. So he says, okay, all right. And the owner puts it all in his backpack for him and sets it on the counter and the guy pays for all this stuff, checks out, and then he grabs the backpack. And at first, he's, he's going to look all cool and like he's done this, lifted this weight before. And so he picks it up and he gets his other arm in there. And then he almost stumbles as he starts to make his way toward the door. And, and then his self-preservation gets the best of his ego. And he groans and he kind of struggles with it. And he says, man, this is heavy. And God goes, yeah. And so he says, what do you do for vacation? And the store owner says, man, I go to the beach. I've got a week back. You see, sometimes we load people up. We say, well, you need to do this and that. And then it's, well, I, I can't do that. Isn't that what Jesus describes here in Matthew 23? A 
if you're in Matthew 23, go back with me now to Matthew chapter 7. This is a popular verse. Perhaps it might be the case that it is more abused than properly used, but it's a call for us to hold it up and then hold our lives up and see. Matthew chapter 7 the first five verses, we find where Jesus addresses earlier in his ministry in this first block of teaching the problem of finger pointing. And now, I'm going to be thinking about every time I've pointed my finger in, so far in this sermon. <laughs> but in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Judge not that you be not judged. But he doesn't stop there. He then explains what he means. He says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You, what's our word? Hypocrites. First, take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So in Matthew 23, it's, I'm going to load you down, but I'm not going to touch it. In Matthew 7, it's, you've got the little speck. I've got the big log. You've seen it portrayed and illustrated in pictures and drawings as a two-by-four sticking out of my head in my eye. And we live in a culture that is frequent to remind us of Matthew 7, 1, but at the same time, a culture where we are encouraged to do exactly that, to point fingers. And what's the old saying here? When I point a finger at you, I've got some pointing back at me, right? That's the first thing, that's the... That might be the, the heart, the, the pure form of hypocrisy. It's where I preach to you. I point my finger at you and I'm going to load you down. But I don't practice myself. And I don't know if there's anything that Satan wants more. If I had to say, I think Satan is more pleased when a Christian doesn't leave Jesus completely, like where they don't do anything, they don't go to church, they don't read their Bible, they just leave the Christianity altogether. I mean, not that Satan doesn't want that, but what he might want more is that we keep going to church, we keep reading our Bibles, we keep telling people we're Christians, but we don't practice, not really. Here's the second thing. Not only does a hypocrite preach, but not practice Hypocrite does what he or she does for men instead of God. Go back to Matthew 23. Let's keep reading together from this chapter. But they would make sure they were extra large so that you could see there was no doubt, even from a distance, ah, that's how righteous they are. Like the, the person that has to show you just how righteous they are. Whether it's by how they dress, whether it's how they sing, or the big offering they put in the collection plate, or whatever it is, they've got to make sure people know about it. And then he says this. They love the place of honor at feast, verse 6, and the best seats in the synagogue. So everyone sees just how zealous they are. And greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. For the hypocrite, being a disciple of Jesus... It's all about how I look to other people. It's about titles and respect and honor. It's about being the person that makes it into the announcements on Sunday morning. It's about 
being the person that everybody knows their name and they see them, yeah, they're right there. Every time the doors are open, they're going to be at church and they're going to make sure that people see them. Am I a hypocrite this morning? Jesus says the hypocrite, they do what they do. So you can see. Jesus tells us today that motives and actions both matter. We sometimes like to think that only actions matter. We sometimes like to think only motives matter. And we'll say, well, I, I, I meant well. Or it's the thought that counts. But for Jesus, both of those can be problematic. And here it is not just that they're doing the right things for the wrong motive. That is a problem in itself. But he also says sometimes it's even how they go about the righteous deed that are a part of this motive in the heart, says, I do it so you can see it. Now, we were in Matthew 7 earlier. Go back for just a moment to Matthew chapter 6. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also here addressed this issue. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, is the basic warning, the strong words about this type of hypocrisy. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 Another use of this word, beware, look out about practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus provides us with three examples Two that immediately follow in verses 2 through 4 and then 5 and 6 about giving or contribution, we usually call it today, about helping people in need, and then about prayer. And then you drop, you drop down verses 16 through 18 and it's about fasting and how they would make sure that everybody knew they were fasting, how pious and how spiritual they were. And he also adds to his first thought when he says, you won't have a reward from your father. And in these examples, he says, if you do it to be seen by others, then you already have your reward. That's the best it's going to get. If I do it so you're impressed, you're, you're impressed. If you are impressed, it's all I get to take home. is the praises and the approval and the applause of other people. So why am I here this morning? Is it so the, the elders see? Is it so because you got to preach a sermon? I mean, that could be the only reason I'm here, right? Why is it that I do the things that I do? Why is it? I'm a disciple of Jesus. And I do a lot of good things, let's say. But Jesus raises the bar and says, that's not enough. And he looks at us in the eye and asks us that, that question. Why? Why do you do it? Do you do it so I see it? Do you do it because you love me? Do you do it because you want my approval? You want my smile? I'm still speaking for Jesus here, by the way. Is that, he says, is that why you do it? Is that why you're in a church building on a Sunday morning, dressed like you are and sitting in the pew? Is that why? Or is it so your spouse will quit bugging you? Or is it so your children will have a good example? And I'm not frowning on that. I mean, that has its place, but What's the real reason you're here this morning? Am I a hypocrite? Jesus says this morning, hypocrites preach instead of practice. But then secondly, this morning, hypocrites, they do it for men instead of God. Here's the last one this morning. Let's return one last time to Matthew 23. We're not even going to make it this morning to the woes that Jesus gives in Matthew 23. We'll come back to those later. 
But in Matthew 23, these last two verses of the opening paragraph, we read these words about hypocrisy. The hypocrite is the one who will be humbled instead of exalted. Because they're the person that strives to exalt themselves. We already read some of this with the titles and places of honor. And they will be humbled by God. Matthew 23, 11 and 12. Jesus then says, The greatest among you, who are they? Who are the greatest people in the church today? They're probably the people that, they're not the people that are in the, the broad likes. They're not the people that people know about. It might be the, the widow. Not too many people may not even know her name. Or it might be the 14-year-old. Who's the greatest? Matthew 23 he says, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Humility, breaking my pride and my arrogance. For this context, primarily my religious ego. Is that a thing? My self-righteousness. That is essential, Jesus is saying. To not being a hypocrite. It says the person that lowers themselves. Not the person who has this pity party, or this person who, who thinks so low of themselves, but this person who thinks accurately in view of the greatness of God and in view of other people, humbles themselves and serves, not for the recognition, but for something more authentic and deeper than that. Let's look at one, Pat, one more passage, shall we? This one is also in Luke. We started in Luke, we're going to end in Luke today. Luke chapter 18, the story of two. Luke 18, beginning in verse 9. As you're making your way there, this is an excerpt from a, a book called Accidental Pharisees. And here's one thing that's written toward the end of that book. In the end, the pathway to becoming an accidental Pharisee. And a large portion of the thought of this book is that we don't usually set out to become a modern day Pharisee or hypocrite. It's usually accidental in a sense. He says it always starts with the same three steps, it appears. Number one, it begins with a failure to grasp the true gravity and depths of my own sin. Number one, my own sin. Number two, it's followed by a heightened disgust for the sins, you guessed it, of others. All this is interlaced. This goes back to Matthew 7, for example. But then thirdly, it's then justified by a cut and paste theology that emphasizes some of the hard sayings of Jesus while pretty much ignoring those that speak of his compassion, mercy, and grace. And on that note, we come to Luke chapter 18, 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector, a traitor. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterer, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. 
But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The story of two. We might look at the first individual as there are a number of traits implied here, aren't there? We might look at someone that focuses on what they aren't doing. I... I'm not unfaithful in my marriage. I'm not stealing from my employer. I'm not. But it's also this list-making approach where I do this and I don't do that. I do this and I don't do that. The good outweighs the bad on this balance of my scales. And so when I get there, Jesus is going to look at me and say, man, you did so great. You were such a good person. You didn't do any of those really bad stuff. And then the second person looks at Jesus who came and died and bled and suffered as the only way that any of us could ever be truly cleansed and righteous and holy and good. That person falls at the feet of Jesus and says, I'm not worthy. Have mercy on me. Am I a hypocrite? A hypocrite, someone who preaches instead of practices. Someone who does it for others instead of God. And someone who in the end will be humbled instead of exalted by God. We sing this song as an invitation from Jesus to come to Jesus like the tax collector and say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be washed in your blood. And so I'm baptized into Jesus. Or as a disciple of Jesus that says, even as someone who's done that, I, I'm still in that same boat in that I still sin. I still need your mercy. Just like yesterday and every day before and every day after, I need you, Jesus, and your blood and your grace. Have mercy on me, sinner. Let's stand together and sing that song.